in mine. All right, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Ford Community Church. We are so glad that you're here with us today. It's gonna be a great day in the house of the Lord. Why is that? Because every day we come into the house of the Lord. Every day you wake up and you come to the church, you come to the assembly, and other people are coming. When two or more are gathered, he's in the midst of it. The prayer team was already praying this morning. His presence has already been here. We've already felt his presence this morning. And today, with you being here in the room as Pastor Joel says, church is better when you're in the room. With you being here, this is just a recipe for an encounter with Jesus. Uh, if you will, if you'll stand with me, uh, we're going to pray, and then we're going to invite God's presence into this room and into this house, and we're going to watch him move within his people today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much, God, for uh, allowing us the, the freedom to approach your throne allowing us the grace and the mercy to come before you in all of our mess and still worship you and glorify you. God, we pray right now that your presence and your spirit rest on this house. We lift up your name as you draw us closer to you, God. We ask for an encounter between heaven and earth today. God, we glorify you for everything that you've done in this church previously. But right now and right here in this moment, we worship you and we lift up your name because you're worthy to be praised. You're worthy to be lifted up. And we know as we lift you up, you will pull us into your presence and you will transform us from the inside out. God, I pray right now that your hand and your spirit be on this house today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship the Lord today. Rising, rising There 
be in the house this morning. All right, let's take a few moments for you to greet your neighbors. Jeremiah 29 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Lord, we just ask, we ask for you to come into this room, Lord. We give ourselves away.
know the Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie. And from the very beginning of time, every word that God has spoken, he's brought to pass. Everything that God has wanted to do and promised that he would do, he's been good on his word and he's done. Amen. So when we sing, great is your faithfulness, we're singing the same song that humanity has been able to sing from the beginning of time. And can I just encourage you this morning, if you're holding on by just the word that God spoke to you, you're holding on to the very best thing that you could be holding on to, and it's the only thing that matters. One more time, are you thankful for God's faithfulness in your life? Amen. Amen. Go ahead, grab a seat while you can. We're so excited. Welcome to Forward Community Church. Welcome to our 9 a.m. service. You guys got up early to get here, and you look good. Look at the person next to you and say, you look good. Look better than you did last week. Some of y'all we didn't see last week. That's a different conversation. Anyway, hey, uh, we're uh, we're so excited to uh, to celebrate what God is doing and uh, what God will do today with you. We just want to say welcome. I got a few things by way of announcements that I want to share with you, but before we do that, we want to pray a blessing over our kids and our nursery ministry as we do every week. And so, if you would just extend your hands to your left and my right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this next generation, this young generation that's being raised up, God, to know who you are, that they can be certain in knowing who they are. God, we thank you for these life-giving ministries. God, inside of these rooms, young people are being raised up in the truth of the gospel, in the truth of your word. God, they're being they're being taught how to love uh, love you and love their neighbor. God, they're they're being told uh, that you created them. God, that you were, they were fearfully and wonderfully made by you, God, that uh, you have a great plan and a destiny for their life. God, we just thank you for, for the ministry that's happening in those rooms, and we just speak a blessing over them. God, we also speak a blessing over all those who are serving to help, uh, help us put together such incredible ministries for this next generation. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Like I said, I want to share a few things uh, by way of announcements. The first is this, if this is your first time here uh, or your second time here, your first time in a long time, we're not going to embarrass you in any way. You don't have to come up front. Uh, but hopefully uh, when you came in, you received a Connect card. If you haven't, they're still available at the desk uh, in our lobby. Uh, if you would just fill that out with as much information as possible and turn it right in uh, back into our uh, at our welcome desk, we would love just personally throughout this week to say thank you for coming and being with us. Uh, coming up this Saturday at 10 a.m., uh, we've got the celebration of life uh, for Jim Polson, uh, an incredible church member, incredible human being, and we're going to honor his life and celebrate uh, the legacy that he has, the impact and influence that he's had uh, on not only uh, the people that are in this room, but uh, so many more. And so make plans to be here uh, Saturday at 10 a.m. Uh, if you, when you walked in, you probably saw the uh, our ministry fair is still up. Those booths are still up. Uh, we wanted to give you an opportunity, uh, another opportunity, uh, or a first opportunity if you weren't here last week, to uh, just to check out the ministries that we have. Uh, they'll be, they're on display at the back end of our sanctuary here and also in the lobby. Uh, there's 10 different booths to check out. They're all different ministry teams. Here's what we believe. Uh, we believe that God doesn't just save us so that we can sit. Uh, God saves us so that we can serve his kingdom, so that we can serve our community. And uh, so we'd love for you to just take a, take a second, have a conversation with one of those uh, department heads, those ministry leaders, just see where, where you might uh, fit in and serve here at Forward. Coming up in just a few weeks, April 24th is uh, on a Wednesday night. We've got a very special worship night, a night of worship that's going to be uh, taking place. We did something similar to this at the beginning of the year, uh, focused on prayer. And if you were there, you just know it was an incredible evening in the presence of God. And so uh, make plans to be here on April the 24th. That's a Wednesday night for our night of worship. And then also... Uh, you can write this down on your calendar. May the 19th uh, is Pastor Appreciation. And so May the 19th, we're going to be uh, honoring our pastor and his family. Uh, this is an, a, a day that we set aside um, that he absolutely hates, um, but also uh, is, is worthy of. And so make plans to be here on the May the 19th. We'll be giving you some more instructions 
uh, about what that day is going to look like, some different things we've got planned. It's going to be an awesome time. Well, we're going to continue to worship the Lord through our giving today. Uh, every single week you hear it from this stage. Thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your obedience to God and your giving. Thank you for your generosity. This really is a generous church. And uh, for this to be the place that you honor God with your giving, that's not lost on us. So thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity. We have several different ways you can give. Whatever's most convenient for you, you can give online by visiting Forward Palmetto. You've got the Church Center app. Uh, you can use that as well. We have a text to give. If you just want to text an, uh, an amount to, I think it's 84321. still is, 84321. Uh, they'll give you some instructions on that. Or in just a moment, you can come and bring your gifts up front. If you would stand to your feet all across the room today, we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to continue to worship you. God, your word says where our treasure is, there our heart would be also. And it is our joy to give to you, to give back to you. God, we are a blessed people, and it is our joy to honor you with our giving. God, I ask that you would uh, bless these gifts, God, that it would continue to help us reach our community for Christ. God, that uh, it, would, it would help us to continue to minister to a world that so desperately needs it. God, and I ask for a special blessing on all those who are giving today. God, we thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, the church said, amen. God bless you as you give today. so much Micah and praise team for leading us into the presence of the Lord it's always a I say it every week it's always a blessing to have this praise team leading us into the, the presence of the Lord and getting us ready to hear the word um, <clears throat> I asked Pastor Joel if I could make one announcement so I wanted to do that before I got into the word yesterday uh, we want to make sure we appreciate Pastor Rose our kids pastor yesterday was our state junior talent competition and we entered, we had three entries into the competition. We had an art entry, a drama entry, and a music entry. And in all three categories, we placed. Um, I, so we are 100% as far as placing. Yeah. Uh, JJ uh, got second place in photography. Um, Judah got first place in drama, in monologue. And Ari got second place in female vocal solo. And, um, and so all three of these are, are eligible to continue on into the international competition, and, and we're, uh, we're not going to make any decisions for any other family. I know for Ari, she's going to go, but the, for the other family, we're going to let them sit down and talk about that before, <clears throat> before we say they're going or anything like that, because that's a big deal. It's in Indianapolis this year, um, and uh, there's... That's a long drive, you know. So there's, I don't know how many states are in between here and in Indiana, but too many um, is how I would phrase it. And so <clears throat> anyway, it's just a big day. Pastor Rose, our kids' pastor, is a big part of that, just allowing our kids, making them aware of what's going on. I'm very appreciative of our, of our church with the heart of putting our kids into ministry and allowing them to be a part of ministries and not pushing them into a room and never letting them see ministry, never letting them be a part of it, and, and then expecting, expecting them to be a part of the church after they grow out of the youth ministry. They're not going to if they're not a part of the church now. And so um, for Forward, the culture has always been the, the talent competitions and the talent, the gifts and all that stuff, and it'll continue to be that way. And so thank you guys for being supportive of that. And if you made it out to support those kids yesterday, thank you for that. It's a big, big deal. Now, with that, I'm pretty excited about uh, what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks because, honestly, I've, had, I've been preparing this specific sermon series for about six months now. Um, I just didn't really know when we were going to do it. And, and it, that's a, you have to kind of get in my head for a minute, which is a very scary place to be. Um, and because I, I, 
Well, sometimes the Lord will start dealing with me about something, and I'll start putting together a sermon or, or a series or, or just something, and then I'm getting about midway through it, and it's like, okay, but this is not for now. I just need you to sit on this for, for a few months, and, and that is torture. Uh, because, and you know this, because if you've been given something by the Lord, or if you've been, you know, you have that feeling you're supposed to do something or whatever, and then it's like, but not yet. You're like, oh, you know, it's, it's like the kid on Christmas Eve waiting for Christmas morning. No, I want to open the present now. It's shiny, and it's wrapped in my favorite wrapping paper, and I want to see what's inside it. And so I've been putting this together, and I'm like, okay, Lord, when are we going to do this? And in fact, I've even, in our staff meetings, brought up this uh, specific sermon series uh, a few different times. Well, I've got this one called Not Today, Satan, and we're going to try to do that. Blah, blah, blah. And I've just never gotten the green light, the okay. And, and literally, this is how... It went was last week during the altar call, I just had the Holy Spirit kind of speak to me and was like, now go. And, and you guys have seen Luke, my four-year-old. If I say now go to him, you see how fast he runs. And it, okay, on delay, he's gone, right? I don't do that. Because I'm old and tired and don't want to run that fast. But my brain will operate that way. And so when the Lord said, okay, now go, I was like, ha, I've been, I'm prepared to go now. And I'm ready to go. So we're going to start this. Now, I'll have to be honest. I don't think we're going to finish this sermon today. Because there's way too much information I want to go over and, and want to preach about and talk about. So well, this might be a two-parter thing. Because if you've ever had the TV show where like it's like, to be continued, Right? Um, before Netflix, if you're, you know, under 30, before Netflix, you couldn't just go to the next episode. You had to wait a week in turmoil, okay, to figure out what happened next. And that's why we're more patient than you all are, because <laughs> we just had to wait to see what would happen. Even now with the Avengers movies, you remember they lost them one movie, and then a year later is when we found out how they'd win. If Ken, if People watch that losing one now. I make them wait. You know, let's watch the next one. No. You will wait in turmoil like the rest of us and then sell it, that kind of thing, right? Now, so we might not get through all of this. There might be a to be continued. Uh, we'll see. Not today, Satan, is the idea. I want you see, we started this year talking about every, uh, breakthrough. This is your year of breakthrough. Yeah. You know, breaking down the walls, the things you couldn't do, the things you couldn't get through, the cycles you couldn't get out of, all that stuff, the same things you kept circling back around and facing. No, you're going to break through, you're going to break through. And I was, began to kind of think about, yes, we have these big mountaintop and miraculous breakthroughs, we have all of that stuff, but what about the in-between? What about the times when, yes, you, you didn't have the big miracle, you know, happen or, you know, whatever, or you didn't have the big moment in the altar call where the presence of the Lord was so heavy and, and, and you're just bawling your eyes. That, you know what I'm talking? Everybody's kind of experienced that at some point in some form. And then what about the times in between that, in between the mountaintops? What about those breakthroughs? Because there's everyday breakthroughs that might not seem like a big deal to you now. But they're huge in the kingdom. And they're the difference between who you are now and who you used to be. Not today, Satan. There are times when the enemy tries to beat us down and steal our victory. And in the past, he won. But not today, Satan. You know, when the guy cuts you off on 301... And the enemy tries to get you to go back to that lack of self-control person. In the past, that worked. But not today, Satan. When you're stressed out at work because you got that one coworker that you know, nope, we ain't going to get along. Mm -mm. If we both make it to heaven, we're not sitting at the table together. <laughs> that kind of thing, right? And they're, they're there, and they're making your day miserable. And in the past, that got into your spirit, got into your head. But not today, Satan. 
when you're stressed out at home because you've asked your husband to do this one thing. <laughs> and it has now been months or weeks. And they keep saying, I'm going to do it. And get upset with you when you get mad at them for not having done it. And in the past, that's caused problems in your house, in your spirit. But not today, Satan. Or uh, let's not just pick on one side. You just wanted 30 minutes of peace. But your wife decided the best time to talk was right now. Your baseball team went into overtime, and you just want to see how it plays out, but now's the time we need to discuss what happened today. And usually that's going to frustrate you and send you into a spiral, but not today, Satan. The things, little things that used to mess you up, and have before, stole your victory, stole your breakthrough, sent you backwards in your progress. I want to declare today that they may have worked before, but not today, Satan. I want to go to 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to read verse 17 through 19. 1 Kings 18, 17 through 19, all right? It says, I'm reading from the ESV. It says, when Ahab saw Elijah... Ahab said to him, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have and your father's house because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the bells. Now, therefore, send and gather all of Israel to me at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Heavenly Father, bless this word today. Let it be your words and not my own. Let them hear from you today and not Pastor Lloyd. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Not today, Satan. That's the, I want you to walk away with that in your head. I'm going to say those three words over and over and over today because on Monday, something's going to happen, and I want in your heart, I want that to be the first response. Uh-uh, not today, Satan. I am, mm -mm. This is a story of Elijah the prophet, and it is a very famous story, and you may have heard this story before when we get into the meat of this, and this is a story where Elijah has just grown tired of the enemy winning. He grew tired of the enemy winning in the kingdom. He grew tired of the, of the enemy winning in culture. He grew tired of people turning away. He grew tired of it, and it started to get him to the place where he was done with it. He was tired of the enemy getting louder and God's people getting quieter. He grew tired of the amount of people compromising and kneeling toward the culture of that day. He grew tired of false, that false gods had infiltrated the culture and the government, and they're trying to remove the God of Jacob from culture, and the people were starting to listen. He grew tired of that. Even when he, the prophet, was trying to make a stand for the kingdom of heaven, they were mocking him, and he grew tired of it. It got to him, and if you've ever been in that place where you're just like, that's it, I'm done, and for me, it's usually in a car. A lot of times, it's in a car. Most of the time, my family's in the car with me. They're bickering in the back, or they're not listening, or they're, they're, there's too much talking, and I'm, I'm starting to get overstimulated because all this is going on, and finally, it's like, that's it. I'm done. Turn it around. If we got to wait 30 minutes in 301, we're going to wait 30 minutes heading back home. And when you get to that point, excuse me, where you're, I'm done, I've had enough. When you get to that point, you realize, man, your resolve is so much stronger in that moment than it was a few minutes before. It becomes this, I'm finished dealing with this, I'm, I'm so sick of this, I'm done with this, I'm not having it anymore. So Elijah calls 
the enemy out. And he draws a line in the sand. I've had enough. I'm done. And I want to say to you today, you have to get yourself spiritually to the point where you are tired and done letting the enemy, the devil, steal your Monday through Friday. See, a lot of times the devil will allow you to have your Sunday breakthrough if he knows he can take it back from you on Monday. You can come up here and cry at the altar all you want. You can celebrate and make your Instagram post all you want, okay? He'll let you do that if he knows he's going to take it back from you on Monday. Doesn't bother him. You can have your 24-hour feel good if I can pull you backwards on Monday. The moment you go to work, if I can turn you back around, or the moment you get around your friends or your family or whatever the case is, if I can pull you back, then go ahead, have your way. That's fine. You're going to come back to me. And you've got to get to the point where you're done losing in the week and trying to keep your victory on Sunday. You know, there's breakthrough on Mondays. There's encounters on Tuesdays. There's miracles on Wednesdays. There's victories on Thursdays. There's triumphs on Fridays. There's breakthroughs every day. There's victories every day. And many times we miss out on this week of breakthrough and this week of victory because we start letting the enemy steal them from us throughout the week. But not today, Satan. And so you know this story. I'm going to read a very large passage right here. In 1 Kings 18, we're going to start with verse 20 here. So Ahab, this is the person that Elijah told, go gather him up. I'm done. We're dealing with this right now. So Ahab sent all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long are you going to go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, just follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. So let two bulls be given to us, and let them choose one bull for themselves, and cut it in pieces, lay it on the wood, and put no fire to it. I'll prepare the other bull, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire to it. And you can call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. That's crazy. He just challenged everything they believe in. And the, their response was, he's a good speaker. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first, for you are many. Call upon the name of your God and put no fire to it. And they took the bull that was given them, they prepared it, and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry louder, for he's a god. He, he is musing, or he's relieving himself, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud, and they cut themselves after their custom in, with swords and lances until blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation. But there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. I like that part. This is my own little commentary, but I, I love that part. They did all this stuff. They cut them. Let me just say this right now. In this trend, especially in, in the, ne the younger generation, there's a trend of dealing with your stress by cutting. We see that in the Bible. That's not new. That's not a new trend. And what it actually is is an offering unto a false god. And so I love the part where they go through all of this. Elijah starts mocking them and saying, hey, maybe he's asleep. Wake him up. Maybe he's going to the bathroom. Maybe he's, you know, he's out right now. Leave a voicemail. He'll call you back. You know, they're, they're doing all this stuff. And then after they do all of it, it doesn't work. He says, all right, come here. Now, 
Elijah, on verse 31, took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as a wood, as would contain two seas of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars with water and pour it on it the burnt offering of the wood. And he said, now do it a second time. And they did it. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with the water. And at the time of the offering of oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and I've done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that these people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is good. The Lord, or the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Let none of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook and slaughtered them there. That escalated quickly. He's like, here's what we're going to do. But he gets himself to the point. He was so tired of what, seeing what the enemy was doing, and he grew tired of the distractions and the deterrence of the children of Israel. He grew sick and tired of the enemy's taunts and the torments that he, Ahab taunted him to his face. That first passage I read, Elijah's walking to Ahab, and Ahab greets him saying, oh, look at you, troublemaker. This is how loud the enemy had gotten that he, they were mocking the prophet to his face. So he called him out. He called out Ahab. He called out the prophets of Baal. He even threw in Jezebel's name because he knew she was hiding somewhere in the midst of that. And this was a do or die situation. What would happen if this didn't work, Elijah? What would happen? What would he have done had God not answered by fire? What would he have done? This was not an easy, oh, I can explain this if it doesn't work. We can use our little spiritual wording loopholes to make it sound like I didn't say the wrong thing. We can know. This was a, look, you're going to do this. I'm going to do it. One of these gods will answer by fire, and whoever does, they're God, and everyone should serve them. He called out the enemy and placed himself in a God's got to come through or I'm going to fail miserably situation. Everything would have increased had God not sent that fire that day. The taunts, the torments, the lies, the influence of the enemy, there's no reason why they wouldn't have turned on him physically. He was mocking their God. He was mocking them. They would have turned, the mob would have turned on him in a heartbeat had God not shown up. And he didn't ask for a little thing either. It wasn't a little faith. Like, Lord, if you'll just send a breeze. Lord, if you'll just send something, like somebody say, yeah, that God is God. He is good all the time. No. I want fire to fall from the sky. And if your God answers prophets of Baal, I'll publicly acknowledge he's God. That's the kind of faith that can look the enemy in the face and say, you no longer own me. You know what? If your God comes through, you know, when I was a youth pastor, the, the, the word tolerance came up in schools. We're practicing tolerance. And I knew a lot of youth pastors that hated it. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And here's why. Let me tell you, and I mean, even the ones that were in my youth group, they'll they will attest to this. I said it's the best thing that's ever happened to the kingdom of God because I have to listen to whatever beliefs they have, but now they have to listen to mine. And I'm willing to bet mine will stand up against theirs. I've had enough. Let me ask you this question. Have you had enough of the enemy winning? Have you had enough of the devil stealing from you? The Bible says he's out to steal, kill, and destroy. Have you had enough of that? Stealing your joy, stealing your peace, uh, stealing your, your mental peace, stealing uh, um, 
stealing from your kids, stealing from your marriage, stealing from you, you're uh, stealing from your victory, stealing uh, your He's putting stress on you. He's, put, he's overwhelming you. He's stealing your financial breakthrough. Have you had enough yet? Have you had enough yet of a culture that seems to be okay to everything except Christianity? Have you had enough yet? Have you had enough yet? Because I've had enough. I've had enough of the moment I get into a situation where my, the pressure's on me, I start to bend and break instead of standing strong. I've had enough of that. And my hope is that you have too. So how do I take back the victory and the breakthrough? The stuff that I'm praying for on Sunday, the stuff that I'm experiencing when I'm with the body of Christ, how do I take it back when the enemy has taken it from me? Because there are many people that have experienced breakthrough, have experienced victory, but something came along and stole it from them. So how do I take it back? And Elijah lays out this formula. It's literally a math formula, math class, math teacher Lloyd. While the falling of the fire is miraculous, the process leading up to that moment was very practical. And I want to give you practical approaches on how to keep your victory and take it back. It's time to call out the enemy when you see it. Call it out. That's the devil. You know what? It's actually not that coworker. Now, they may be annoying. They may be obnoxious. But they're not getting into your head, getting into your spirit. The enemy is. So call out the enemy. It's actually not your spouse. Now, they might have some traits that you really wish the Lord would work on within them. But it's the enemy getting into your heart and into your head and into your spirit through them. It's not your boss. As much as you may think it is, I can't stand that guy. Or I can't stand that girl. I don't know. It's the enemy getting into you through them. Call out the enemy. So there's a catch in calling them out, though. Don't expect to defeat the kingdom of hell if you're not prepared to face it. So years ago, and, and I, don't, I don't remember if Travis was, if he was there that year, but I was at youth camp one year in Kentucky, and I was the head dorm leader, the head boys dorm leader. And my job was to get all the boys in the dorms at night. And one, in, in one year, we had three or four dorms that were just not going to bed. They weren't going to their dorm. Now, I was very lax in it. I was like, listen, I don't, I don't care if you go to bed. Just get in your room, right? Because I can't go to bed until you all are in your rooms. It, it, there's liabilities, all sorts of stuff, right? And so we're doing, I'm doing this. I'm sitting there, buddy. But I've got this one room that's just being super rebellious. And I'm trying to figure out why because it, it wasn't, it was kind of out of character. And Immediately, they had a new dorm leader, his first time ever doing it at camp, and this guy was massive. He was huge. He, I mean, like most people are to me, but he was massive, <laughs> right? I mean, he was the closest thing to Goliath the earth has ever seen. And so I'm like, guys, and finally I'm getting frustrated. I'm like, guys, I just need you to go to your room. And he looks at me and he says, make me. So I was like, I was like, okay, so we're going to have to go there. So I was like, I looked at him like this. And I was like, I will walk over there and put you in that room. Now, there was no chance that was happening. <laughs> but he didn't need to know that. He needed to think, Man, Lloyd's got something up his sleeve. He's got something going. That, that, that's, the, that's the aura that I want to, to pass out here. Like, oh, wait a minute. But he wasn't budging. And so I turned around and looked at all my friends, Carl, all these guys, Paul, these guys that I grew up with. They're nowhere near. They were with me when the conversation first started. But in that moment, they were in a golf cart heading the other way. And so I was by myself, and I was not about to back down. He was going to eat me. But I was going to be more than just a midnight snack. 
a full meal. So here's what happens. We get to this big moment, and then all of a sudden, the kids were like, hold on. We'll just go to our room. I was like, When you call out the enemy, you're going to have to face him and be prepared to do that. Some of you all can't say not today, Satan, because you're not prepared to face him when you put him in his place. Because he has too much influence over our lives. His words still carry too much weight in our hearts. His lies still affect our mind too much. Call out the enemy. The second part I want you to do, repair the altar. It's a big moment in what Elijah does when he's putting all this together, right? So before the fire could fall, Elijah had to examine the altars that the fire would fall on. Once he saw the altars had been torn down, he had to repair them. The fire's not going to fall on an altar that cannot withstand his presence. Listen to me. The favor that you are praying for will not fall on an altar that cannot carry it. The fire that you say you want will not rest on an altar that's not strong enough to hold it. You see, and I I hate saying this, but you see pastors and ministers have massive moral failures in front of, you know, you've seen these on the news, you've seen documentaries about it, all that stuff. Here's what happened. They're requesting fire and favor to fall that their character is not prepared to hold. And so they'll get to a certain point and then they'll fall and they'll crumble. Elijah saw that the altar would not be prepared to handle the miracle he was praying for. So before he called it down, he took the time to repair it. Reparation is preparation. And and it's a weird wording. I looked it up because I was like, how is this going to work? Reparation. What you're doing by repairing The altars is your preparing for the presence of the Lord to rest on your life, on your heart, on your mind. So what's an altar? An altar is a covenant between God. God says, you come to the altar, I will meet you there. It is a meeting place between the presence of God and man. In the Hebrew Bible, uh, in the in the Hebrew Bible were typically made of earth, the altars were typically made of earth or unwrought stone. Altars are generally built in, in conspicuous places. The first altar recorded in the Bible is, is actually built by Noah. Altars are built by Abraham. Altars are built by Isaac. Altars are built by Jacob. Altars are built by Moses. Altars are built all through the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's a structure upon which offerings such as sacrifices are made for a religious purpose. The altar is a raised platform with a flat surface, and in the scriptures, there's over 400 references to altars. This is why we do offering the way we do here, because there's something about bringing your gift to the altar and laying it there. So what happens at altars? It's where a sacrifice of praise are given. This is all scriptural based. You can look it up. Sacrifice of praise is given. Altars is where sacrifices uh, unto God are laid down. It's where atonement and repentance take place. It's where things that aren't pleasing to God go to die. Altars aren't necessary. They're not and and you ever seen these really pretty altars in churches? That's not real. Altars are not pretty. They're actually terrible. They're ugly. They're, They're 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 supposed to be, and that's what makes them beautiful. Because the things that aren't of God die at the altar. And the things that are of God will literally be resurrected and reborn and refined at 
the altar. Elijah knew if I'm going to face the enemy, if I'm going to have a miracle fall and rest there, I have to have my altar in place so that it can house it and manage it and hold it. If not, the fire will fall, but that altar will break and crumble and I will look foolish in the process. God will not be glorified because the story will be about my failure. Elijah is in the middle of a battle where his life was on the line, but in the middle of the fight, he stopped and said, if I'm going to win, if I'm going to have victory, if I'm going to keep my breakthrough, i got to prepare this altar. So where are the altars today? Where is the altar of prayer laid out in Scripture, of intercession, praying for the sick, praying for each other, seeking God's face publicly and privately. Do you have an altar in your home? Now, that doesn't mean you lay out a big place in stone and everything. there's like blood everywhere. Don't do that. You'll end up on the news, okay? But there's a place where you should be able to go where the things in your life that are not of God will die and the things that God is doing in your life, he will breathe more life into a prayer closet, a place where you can go that's set aside. I had a prayer table in my office. <clears throat> a prayer table in my Everywhere I went, if I was going into deep prayer, I was here or I was at this prayer table in my office. And it's that table that I would sit there and I would seek the Lord. I cried over church members. I cried over the church direction. I, I mean, I boohoo. That's where I went. But every time I went there, I met with God there. His presence, knew, his presence was there. And it got to the place where I could sit there and immediately get in. Why? Because that place was dedicated to the presence of the Lord. That was my altar. Where's the altar of discipleship? where you're taking people, uh, I get so frustrated with, with ministries, with churches that are all about getting them saved and, and getting them turned around and then just send them out and hope for the best. That's not of God. God wants to take someone that's, and they get saved and then all of a sudden disciple them and grow them up. Somebody's supposed to come to them and help them. People will walk away from their own breakthrough if nobody's going to help them through it. Have you ever noticed that Jesus never tells his disciples before he ascends into heaven, he never tells the disciples, go to church, get, sa get people saved? He never says that. But what he does say is go out and make disciples. Allow the Spirit to convict, the Savior to save, baptize them, and then make disciples. What about the altar of evangelism? Let me tell you something. Heaven is real and so is hell. And if you are not in alignment with Jesus Christ, watch the news. Right now what's going on on the other side of the world is letting us know that we are soon and very soon hearing the trumpet sound and that Jesus coming back for his church. And if you are not right, if you're not living right, if your heart has not been turned over to him, I suggest you relook at the situation. If your, if your friends or pastors don't love, don't love you enough to tell you when, what is sin and what is sinful because they're trying to keep the relationship, I'm sorry, they have failed you. Now, we don't, you don't have to be a jerk about it. But sin is sin. I didn't call it sin. The word did. Take it up with the writer. I've been in those situations where somebody says, well, do you think that's a sin? I was like, oh, I don't, what I think don't matter. That's what the word says. And what I think is sin? Oh, I don't know. No, the word says this is sin. What about the altars of Pentecost? You know, we're a Pentecostal church, and I'm not going to hide from it. Pentecostal isn't something you wear. It's not a dress code or a dance. And it bothers me that the church has failed. And Michael, I'm getting ready to close. I knew we weren't going to get through all of this. It bothers me that churches have allowed the word Pentecost to be equated to a dress code. Pentecost is not a style. It's not. Pentecost is spirit-breathed. It's Holy Spirit-infused. That's what Pentecost is. 
It's a fire shut up in my bones and resting on my shoulders. It's a comforter, a guider, and if need be, a weapon that's powerful enough to bring down a stronghold. You know what we have? We have one of the strongest altars ever that we can access. The name above every other name. Jesus. It fits the description. Torn down, beaten down, broken down, bloody. It's not pretty, but it's powerful. Where the things that aren't of God come and die, and new life is breathed and resurrected. It's got to be about Jesus. The altar has to be about Jesus. It can't be about the name of the church. We've got, I, I love our name. I love our vision. We have other pastors calling us trying to get, like, how did you come up with your name? How did you go through the whole process? And, and I love it. That's why we have uh, clothes and merchandise for it. And we got new ones that today. I'm wearing one. I love it. It's great. It's soft and comfortable. They're on sale. But it can't be about the name of the church. It can't be about a denomination. We are a part of a denomination. If you didn't know that, that's our bad. Also, I would like to point out there's a big blue signia out there out front that should show you that. But we're a part of an organization that protects us and covers us. But it can't be about that. You know what? It can't be about the name of the pastor either. It's amazing what will happen. Certain people, certain ministers think their name brings authority. If I show up. I'm going to lay my hands. God, you know, no, I don't do that. We don't do celebrities here. I don't do superstars in my staff. If, they, if they're trying to build a platform, they got to go. It's got to be about the name of Jesus. And that's the altar that withstands. Remember the old song? Can't nobody do me like Jesus It's still the name. It's the altar that causes sickness to run. It's the altar that causes death to fear. It's the altar that causes the grave to lose its grip. It's the altar that causes demons to bow and Satan to panic. We keep going. <laughs> we keep going to our politicians, hoping they're going to save us. They ain't, ain't going to do nothing. I'm just going to tell you right now, red, both red and blue, most of them are crazy. We keep pointing to our pastors. I have a pastor that I respect and love dearly. He has influence in my life. He corrects me all the time. I have people that I go to for advice and respect. But they're not going to save me. They're not going to transform me. I can't go to them and have all the things that aren't of God that are brewing within my spirit and my heart sacrificed and new life being breathed into me. That's not how it works. But I can go to Jesus. The church was founded on Jesus. It was built on Jesus. If it remains on Jesus, it will stand because of Jesus. Let me ask you a question. If you want to be able to have the ability, Elijah had a lot of confidence. Man, could you imagine looking at an entire culture and saying, one of us is going to bow? Could you imagine that kind of faith and confidence in your faith? And I believe with all of my heart, it was b before, because we're going to talk about the fire falling. That's probably, that's next week. It's definitely next week. But before we got there, before he got there, he had to get himself to the point to where he was willing to make the stand and he had to just observe and analyze and say, okay, is my altar 
ready to receive what I'm praying for. Because sometimes the Lord might not be withholding the fire and the favor and the breakthrough that you're praying for because he doesn't want to give it to you. No, he's withholding it because if he gave it to you now, you'd crumble and break under the weight of it. I want to be able on Monday when things don't go my way, when I think we've had a great church service, and and let me just say, stop for a minute. This has not occurred to me. This has not happened here. But I know of pastors that deal with this. But I, I think we've had a great church service and God has moved in a great and mighty way. And Monday morning I get a voicemail and an email with a massive complaint. And I want to be like, oh, I'm done. I'm, here. I'm going back to the medical field. I want to be like, no, I want to have the faith. But nope, when that stuff comes, because eventually it's going to. If y'all heard, you have heard me preach. I'm going to say something stupid at some point. We're like, nope, not to, I'm not letting that win. Not today, Satan. When somebody tries to pull me into their drama, not today, Satan. When sin tries to creep in, not today, Satan. When old toxic traits try to come back up, when addiction tries to show back up and, and tempt me back into it, not today, Satan. I want that faith. But in order to have that confidence, I got to make sure my altar is ready because I need God to move when I'm in that conflict. I need his presence and his favor to fall and rest on me. And in order to do that, my altar has to be repaired if it's been torn down. And I want to ask you today as you're altar ready to receive what you're praying for if you'll stand with me the passage that I read the whole story it says he looks at the he examines the altars and sees that they've been torn down and so he takes a minute and repairs them He takes some time to repair them. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to take some time to repair our altars. Have you been torn down? Does it really matter who tore them down? There's so many times we want to focus on who tore my altar down. Who tore my heart apart? Who let me down? Who did? You know what? Does it really matter? Are they that important in this equation? Are they that important in this situation? Or is it more important that to acknowledge the fact that your altar is torn down and it needs to be repaired? Because God wants to bless you. He wants fire to fall and rest on you. He wants favor to rest on you. He wants victory to rest on you. He wants breakthrough to rest on you. Let go of those people and focus on your altar. It's amazing that Elijah didn't even include in the passage who tore it down. Just wasn't part of it. He just knew they needed to be repaired. So what I want to do today is I'm going to open this altar. I've been excited about this moment because we actually... We've had two weeks where we didn't do altar calls. Where we have come to the altar that we didn't on purpose. The two services were going different ways. But also, now that I see the Lord moving and laying it out, He was literally preparing us to come back to the altar. That's crazy. That's crazy how He moves. It's crazy how He moves. I want to ask right now, if you'll just take a second and search your own heart. God, is my altar prepared to receive the fire and the favor that I'm praying for? Is it prepared to hold the fire that wants to rest on my shoulders? 
I want to make the stand, not today, Satan. I want to be able to say it with confidence, knowing if it comes to uh, a, a do or die situation, the fire is going to rest on my side. The fire is going to fall on my side. The favor is going to rest on my side. And, and, and you will be glorified, Lord, and the story won't be about my failure. It'll be about how you came through. But in order to do that, I need to make sure my altar is prepared to receive it. God, is there cracks in my altar? Has it been torn down? This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to open the altars right now for anybody that says, Lord, that says, Pastor Lloyd, I'm praying for something big. I'm believing for something big. And I don't know what the big is for you. That's all relative to your situation, right? I'm praying for something big. And I need my altar to be ready for that big. Because I'm believing that this is my year of breakthrough. I'm believing this is my year of victory. And that it's going to take place. But I want to make sure my altar is ready. I want to make sure I'm ready to have the presence of the Lord rest. I need to repair my altar, my heart. I need to take the time to analyze where did I let the enemy come in? Where was it? And call out that enemy. Who, what victories are being stolen from me? What breakthroughs are being stolen from me? Where's my confidence going? Where's my peace going? Where's my, my, the strength of my mind going? Where's all of this going? Where, who's taking it? What's happening? And I want to repair it and build it upon you in your name only. Heavenly Father, prepare this room right now. Prepare this altar to receive those, God, that are praying for something big and need to take uh, just inventory of where their heart and their altar is. God, I pray right now for anybody that is already through this message and through this time is starting to look into their heart and say, okay, this is where the enemy's crept in. This is the breakthrough that I've lost. This is the victory that's been stolen from me. This is what's going on. And all those times that has happened before and it may have worked before, but not today, Satan. We're going to come to this altar, God, and your presence is going to meet us here. Your spirit is going to meet us here, God. And you are going to repair the altar within us, repair our heart, God. Restore it, God. Renew it, God. And refresh it, God, so that we can look at the enemy with confidence, with faith, and say, no, you don't win. You won't win. You, I'm tired of your influence, and I'm tired of your taunts. He is God, and I will serve him. If that's you right now, and you need God to restore your altar. I want you to come right now. We're going to pray with you. We're going to praise the Lord. We're going to worship and we're going to sing. Don't wait on anybody else. Don't look around. You're not the only one. You're the first one. Be the one that comes up and, and comes to the Lord and God will meet you here. Let's pray and let's praise the Lord.
says, I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. That, that's amazing. But it's that last part that, that is the ingredient. Because more of him means less of me. It means I empty myself out of my, myself, all of the mess that I am, so that more, because I want more of him. This week, All the times the enemy is going to try to get in your ear. Come on up here. All the times the enemy is trying to get in your ear. All the times the enemy tries to, to get in your head. All the time. You, even now, if you've prayed at the altar, you felt God move here at the altar, you felt his prayer, you're going to walk out and the enemy's going to be like, you know you were just tired, right? You're just emotional. Uh, that's, going, that's going to happen. Oh, well, I didn't feel anything really change. That, that has worked before, but not Today, Satan. All right, I'm done. I got to get out of your way. Come on. Aren't you thankful you showed up at church this morning? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hey, well, as we're dismissing a couple things, uh, we do have our ministry tables for all of our ministries here. Uh, make sure you stop by there before you leave. They have cards that you can fill out if you're interested in serving. Uh, also, Pastor Ben normally comes up at this time, and he's getting set up at his booth. Uh, we just want to highlight something awesome that happened in our student ministry. Uh, they had a record attendance last Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, almost 40 in attendance. So they were pulling out extra chairs. And so uh, if you're interested in serving in youth ministry, it's a great time. It's a growing ministry. I want to pray a blessing over you. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you have done. Thank you, Holy Spirit for what you have done and what you will continue to do in the lives of this church individually and corporately. God, we just speak life over your people today. Bless them in their coming and bless them in their going. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Have a great rest of your weekend.